Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Circe Olson Westner. I'm the founder of the Museum of the American Military Family and I am part of the Veteran Family Community Collaborative in Tejeras, New Mexico. I'm really glad to introduce the second part of the program, <laughs> so you want to write a book, now what? I'm joined by my co-moderator, Natalie Williamson, also from the Collaborative, and we have a very diverse panel today, um, comprised of brats and vets and spouse authors, and they have written a diverse, selection of work. And so we're going to be very excited uh, to have a good conversation today. And so I'm going to let them introduce themselves and their books. So we'll start with Bernard. Hello, everyone. My name is Bernard N. Lee Jr. My dad was in the Army, and I traveled with him around the world and in the United States for 20 years. I wrote a book about it entitled A Look Back in Time, Memoir of a Military Kid in the 50s. Cool. All right, who's next? I'll step up. Okay. I'm Jan Wirtz. Uh, I had gotten my start with writing memoirs. My first one was Over the Pond. It's not exactly published, but it is present in uh, five museums so far, including Museum of the <laughs> Military Family. Well, very cool. I have that. I love that. that Aside from that, I have written for the local newspaper. As you can see, I even got the headline with my first one from a storm chase tour. <laughs> cool. cool. And okay. of course, I have written in a, for the books for Cersei. Oh, yeah. He's written for almost every single one of our anthologies. Very good. <laughs> All right, who's next? I'll go next. Okay. I'm Nancy Young, and my <laughs> I'm an army brat traveled with my parents all over the world until I was about 21 and decided I wasn't going to be in school, and my parents were going to Korea, so they promptly took my ID card and ripped it up. And off they went. And then I lived around the Washington DC Beltway for lots of years, had kids. And I, when I was 60 or so, moved in with my dad, who was in his 80s, a widow, were at the time. And my book, Tea with Dad, is how we basically realized we didn't know a whole lot about one another. And um, the it's really a story about how I came to know him how I learned more about my mom and their relationship. And at the end, kind of rediscovered myself. And I have to tell you that if I hadn't, we would have muddled along when I moved in at the end of, towards the end of his life, but it wouldn't have been as wonderful as it is now because of the time we've had together, having tea every day. Go <laughs> next. Hi, Michelle Y. Green. My father was a Tuskegee Airman. Um, my mother was a riveter. She's 96. She just had surgery and she came through it like a charm. Uh, I, my very first book was called Willie Pearl. It's written, um, it's about a depression era coal mining town where both my mother and my father met. Um, and the second in the series is called Willie Pearl Under the Mountain. And it was a, uh, one of the first multicultural doll and book sets. We created two dolls, one of my mother and one of her best friend, May Ella. My most current book is called A Strong Light Arm, the story of Mamie Peanut Johnson. Um, and this was done, the hardback was done almost uh, a little over 12 years ago. Uh, a film is being made of this book called Throw Like a Girl. And it won the Carter G. Carter G. Woodson Award uh, for um, a, a, an honorable mention. And it was also, we have a bobblehead that has been created and we're doing a book and bo bobblehead promotion <laughs> starting next week. I'm also a um, taking the teaching of writing at Johns Hopkins University and I have a master's degree, degree in writing from there. I live in Upper Marlboro near Washington, DC. <laughs> Very in Salisbury, Maryland. 
Oh, there, we're gonna make some friends. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Okay. Go. Name, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. My name is Johnny W. Lewis. I'm a Navy brat, Air Force brat, uh, Army wife, and sister to very <laughs> a slew of veterans right now. Sister and aunt to a slew of veterans. Um, I started writing because I started storytelling. I have four younger brothers. Uh, as you can tell by my name, um, I got it because my father was a chief petty officer in the Navy. You can't tell them anything. They know it all because they were in the <laughs> Navy. So when someone told him, don't name your oldest child after yourself, you might have a son. I have four brothers he could have given his lovely name to. <laughs> but because of that, I've had a life of continual controversy. No one believing what I had to say until I started putting it into words. So I have written 46 books, uh, 17 of which are educational books. And then there are children's uh, chapter books and teacher supplemental books, science books, such as the uh, Flutter by the Butterfly series. I also wrote a novel one time, just a, a romantic novel, just because. I wanted to see if I could. <laughs> so life has been good simply because of writing. Right now, my husband and I are of uh, 49 years. <laughs> we celebrated that on January 4th. Uh, we are living in an RV, traveling the country, all over the place. So cool. that's our story. <laughs> Very cool. Robert. Okay. Thanks. I'm Robert Wunsch. I live in Solon, Ohio with my wife, who's actually sitting on the couch beside me, but she's keeping <laughs> quiet, I hope. Uh, I was a retired Army captain from the 14th Armored Cavalry. I think Cersei knows that very well. And I have written three books. It's a trilogy of the Old West before Cowboys. Uh, the most recent one is made of Morgan's Point. And the middle one is Ashes on His Boot, which won a minor military novel award. And the last one is The Civil Sword, which has a lot about Tennessee and the Hermitage and Andrew Jackson in it. But basically, I tried to tell the story from the period after the Revolutionary War up until the Civil War which hasn't really been written a lot about. And that's pretty much my life, other than the fact that I was a, an a, uh, international sales executive for Caterpillar uh, Tractor Company in Peoria, Illinois, and 42 other countries. That's it. Very cool. Sandy, did you? Yes, hi. I'm Sandy Hanna. I'm an Army brat. Uh, my father was uh, a colonel and used to be Patton's Ordnance Officer in World War II. And my memoir is about growing up in Vietnam. I was a child, 12 years old, of the ignorance of bliss, an American kid in Saigon. And I came to write it because my father gave me an expose by the uh, regime that was uh, ruling at the time six in the early 60s and basically predicting the outcome of the war it was given to him by his Vietnamese counterpart. So it wasn't until he was in the 80s, his 80s that he like slid it across the table, gave it to me and put me under assignment. You didn't tell the colonel no. So he said, it's time to write the story so that people really understand what happened and why. And he said, if you don't understand history, you repeat it. And so um, I ended up writing this, and I must say it, it did a lot for me looking back at my life as a brat, growing up all over, the siblings' re our relationship with my siblings, and unveiling a story that very few people realize about what was going on in Vietnam prior to major conflict starting. <laughs> Am I the last one? Hold on one second. Okay, okay. yeah, Kate, please. Yes. Uh, 
first of all, Cersei, thank you for being here, for letting me be here. Um, I am a novelist, write consistently for Sapphire Books, currently have seven novels out, uh, and four, four of them uh, draw rather heavily on, uh, on veteran main characters. I myself am a veteran of the U.S. Naval Reserve, um, leaving as a lieutenant commander in 2001. Uh, and I, Cersei, I, four, three of the books are part of a, a fantasy trilogy, uh, or a magical realism trilogy, uh, called Starts with the Kiva and the Mosque. And the main character is a Navy vet for some odd reason. Uh, and the one I'm, I'm happiest with at the moment is my latest book, uh, Broken. Ah, look, I just got hey, it. Hey, there you <laughs> go. You just got it. All right. <laughs> and Susie was there the day I was motivated to write this book because uh, there was a state conference about using the arts to serve veterans. And there was an amazing young, fresh out of the Marines, uh, big strapping guy who at one point, and I believe if I recall correctly, Cersei, even though there were about 50 people there, there were only like three or four veterans. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of the event, uh, this wonderful young man stood up to tell his story and, and lost it. He just oh. sobbed uncontrollably. Um, and nobody knew what to do. And I was way the heck on the other side of the room and finally just walked across uh, to hold him while I cried because there's not a whole lot you can do. And at that point I realized I had to write something that showed P PTSD from the inside out yeah, thank you. Uh, and gave people a better understanding of what it is and, and potentially how to deal with it, especially for those who love someone who suffers from PTSD. Well, and we're gonna, spend, we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about some of those, um, about healing is writing. Leslie, Susan? Hi, yes, are you sorry, a, you're a surprise guest? <laughs> Well, I, I popped in to listen because um, I got accidentally, I guess, Kate um, <laughs> included in the, the mailing list. And I my memoir is about my father's and how the experience of filming Hiroshima in the aftermath of the atomic bombing kind of affected him and our family. So I just wanted to hear what everybody was saying. Well, you, you get to participate since you're here now. So there, and you're being filmed. So welcome. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I didn't That's, realize. Yeah. Hey, so really quickly, um, some of you have already alluded to it, and some of you um, have said it outright. But my first question to any of you, all of you, is why even write? Why write? OK. So who wants to start? I'll start. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've been a teacher of writing, an adjunct professor, and my students often ask me why write. And I tell them that writing is the second worst job in the world. <laughs> but the first job, the first worst job is not writing. So if you have a penchant for writing, the point is if you have that gift, if you know that there's something inside of you that you must express, then you need to write, whether it's journaling, whether it's trying to be self-published, whether it's um, writing cards and notes, which is kind of a dying art right now, or whether it's trying to actually be um, published traditionally. But writing, if you've got that writing spirit, then you just, you really don't have a choice. I think it really is a writing spirit uh, for a lot of people. I wrote letters as a child. We didn't have chat and uh, certainly long distance phone calls were very expensive. So we wrote letters and we looked forward to them. That's how we kept connected. And I pretty much um, lied in all my letters. I wrote fiction. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, my mother finally confronted me and said, did you tell your teacher that your teacher in, at Fort Monmouth that you had a pony? And I went, <laughs> I may have, but I think I was telling a story. Um, and then I think as I went through phases where I couldn't write, uh, literally could not write, except if it was for money, you know, because of the jobs I had. And at the end, I was just spent. I had no words. Um, and then went through a phase where the words came back and I've been writing every day since, sometimes without a purpose. Um, but it was definitely something I didn't control. It was something I had to do. Right. 
is is there any greater magic in humanity than the ability to use language mm -hmm. um, i i know writing for me is is it's a path to healing uh, and it's also a way to, if, if you want to try to make the world a better place, uh, if you have a vision for that, what other tool is there to try to get there uh, than by writing? Can you give me a favor? Sarah? I've always been a storyteller, and I think I've always used words. And so I also became somebody who got completely enamored with children. I ended up working for uh, Sesame Street. I designed a theme park called Sesame Place. My background studies in child development and the biology of cognition. And so I always took the storytelling and this understanding of children. And, and it just got to the point where it was time to write. And I think because I see things through the, the eyes of children, I wrote my first book, my memoir, more or less through a 10 year old's point of view. And it just seemed to go that way, even though I always I didn't write it down until, well, I'm, I'm now 70. I didn't write till I was about 68, any form that would be considered uh, a memoir or a book. Well, I, I have written 300, limer, 300 limericks since yeah. COVID started and posted each one on Facebook one a day. Uh, that's what I really do. I only publish the first four lines. I put the first four lines in and then all of my friends have to try to fill in the fifth line. <laughs> and that seems to have uh, taken the edge off of some of the uh, downtime for a lot of people that are my friends. But 11 years ago, I got the bug to write uh, a novel or novels to get the story out of my head. It was driving me crazy. And it about uh, the Yellow Rose of Texas. It's been written about forever, uh, but nobody ever told the story right. Uh, and I am from Tennessee and I lived in Texas for a while. And I was always amused, if nothing else, by the relationship between Tennessee and Tennessee over the years. So I sort of put the two together, and that's how I ended up with the three books. It took me 11 years, uh, and I had to hire my own son as the editor. And I, we've probably sold about 700 books in the last uh, few years, so I'm glad I didn't try to make a living yet. <laughs> that's my story but at least it's out of it's out of my head and on paper and I can rest now <laughs> I, I did have a literary coach who who hated everything I wrote when I first started uh, her name's Charlotte Cook she lives here in Cleveland now she did live in San Francisco and she said the most profound thing I ever heard when I was right in the middle of the first book and she said that that writers come to a an empty page with a full mind and read them to a full page with an empty mind. Yeah. And she wanted me to keep that in mind and now I can't get that out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> so well, one thing with writing, just like with any other art form, like say oil painting, mm -hmm. one of the biggest tricks is knowing when you're finished, mm -hmm. when it's done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I want to move on to the next question. Um, and we started this in the first um, podcast a little bit um, with the first panel. But I wanted to ask, how important do you think it is to decide who your audience is before you write a book? Or is it important to know who you're writing for before you actually start writing? I mean, should you just write it down and then decide? I think it depends on the book. Okay. The genre. Um, if I were writing, I just wrote the book, but because it made sense, you know, and then I figured out, wow, this might be something that's interesting to other military brats because I tell it all the chapter, all the chapter titles are military terms. Um, 
there are things in it that when my alpha and beta readers read who grew up as civilians, they were, I have no idea what this means, but I had no idea this was going on. <laughs> you know, and, and yet the military brats went, oh, I remember that. It resonated with them. Um, it talks about, uh, you know, things in my life that I've gone through that, so there are demographics mm -hmm. um, of women that might, it might resonate with, but none of that I thought about until I'd written the book. Um, I can see that there might be some books that I target mm -hmm. in the future, but um, if I sat and thought about that first, I don't know that I'd finish anything because that's how I spent my life, writing for demographics they gave me. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, and, and other people answer this too. I think Sandy is going to say something, but I also wanted to throw out there, has anybody ever targeted the wrong market or the wrong audience too? So, okay, Sandy, did you have something you wanted to say? Well, I, I, I agree with uh, Nancy. I, I wrote the book simply because I needed to write the book and I, I knew it would be of interest to brats. I knew it would be interesting to, to you know, uh, Vietnam vet wife, wives, um, I didn't know how Vietnam vets, a lot of them would take it. Um, I'm a boomer, so I knew boomers would be interested because they were so confused mm -hmm. by the war. But as she said, I, I had to get the story out first. Mm -hmm. And then I could see that it was going to uh, serve those. And I've also been told that it would be perfect for schools, for high schools, for history. And so there, there's all sorts of little uh, directions that it's going now that I hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. um, but I was confident that there were a few that it would serve, but it wasn't my main main point when I wrote it. I, I kindly disagree with both of you. <laughs> uh, I've been traditionally published and I write primarily, well, not primarily, I write for um, middle grade children and for young adults. And it's absolutely critical to identify your audience because there are guidelines. You can't write the same book for a fourth grader that you can for someone that's 13 to 19. Mm -hmm. There are choices that you have to make about vocabulary. There are choices you have to make about uh, structure. If it's a picture book, if it's a chapter book, I mean, there are rules and guidelines that apply to each one of those genres. So you have, in my feeling, you have to identify your, your primary market. And with the strong right arm, for example, it's a biography targeted for seven to 13. But as I wrote it, um, it also appealed to adults, but that was an afterthought. That was like a secondary market. It was, it's about the first woman who ever played, uh, she was a pitcher in the Negro Leagues and it's a biography of Mamie Peanut Johnson. Uh, and you know, it was, it was critical that I write it with the language, for example, in the 1950s when she played, she was a Negro or she was colored. And so the certain language choices, the length of the sentences, the kinds of descriptions that you can use are going to be different. Now, the one I'm writing now about my father and his experience, he, was, he flew in um, World War II Korea and Vietnam in special ops. So the novel that I'm writing called Devil's Bargain is about, it's a story told in three voices about the Vietnam experience. So there's gonna be swear words, there's gonna be blood and guts, which is not going to be appropriate for my seven to 13 year old. And so I, I think it's critical to identify your audience first. And then I would a yeah. wider audience, so much the better. I, I would agree if you're writing for children, you, you definitely have to because they see the world differently and they have different stages of development. I think as you get into the adult market, I think it's not as is That's critical. Right. And in my case, I was writing from a child's point of view. So my language was pretty much what I had as a 10 year old or 12 year old. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's allowed me to open it up to the high school market a little bit. Better. Right. Um, probably I would have if I'd done it differently. I mm -hmm. agree, though. I, I would say that that uh, the, the question you asked really should be a two part question. Okay. Because for me, at least, I have to have a story to tell something that motivates me internally that I need to write for me. But if you want the, the message to get across during that writing and during the editing and during that process, you have to think through what's going to be heard and who is listening. Because it's just like walking in a room full of people. If you don't figure out how to, how to modify your story to the audience, you're talking to yourself. Right. 
Kate, that was exactly what I was going to say, that it doesn't matter whether or not you're supposed, you think you're going to write for seven, seven year olds. The first audience that you have to have is yourself. If you don't believe in what it is you're writing, why are you writing it? For an assignment? I mean, I've written over a hundred articles for a small town newspaper in South Georgia on our travels, specifically on places that we go and how we live in the RV. I mean, 288 square feet is a little small, you know, it's like one of those little tiny houses. Actually, it's smaller than that. But in order for me to be able to write to everyone else to explain to them why the RVing life is important to this particular uh, time in our lives, I have to write to me first, then realize whether or not I can, I need to change some of that language to accommodate sure. people in South sure. Georgia that don't understand, you know, some of the, no offense guys, some of the higher level language skills. <laughs> yeah, well, I think one thing from now on, especially Michelle, with you being a teacher, you are going to be teaching the next generations of writers. And right now, history used to be, you could go back and get diaries. You could go back and get letters like came back from World War II, all the way back to, you know, when Og threw a rock at Oog. But <laughs> now uh, we don't have those written things because everybody's just using a computer like we are today. And uh, yes, it's being recorded, but suppose it gets stored on the media for today and then it gets excavated, say a couple of centuries from now, uh, that would be like getting your great grandfather's uh, autobiography and discovering it's on a five and a half inch floppy. Right. So remember, when the when the people watch this 10 generations from now, you better have your best manners and no cussing or anything, okay? Behave yourself. Military brats. You are representing brats and veterans all over the world. You have child ambassadors. And it will reflect on your family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'm fond of a lot. <laughs> sometimes well, I started of... with my family because after mother died, my dad was sitting around the house moping. I was still working at the hospital. I'm a, in addition to being an Air Force brat, I am a retired laboratory technologist and very glad to be retired. <laughs> I won't go into the whys, they're kind of obvious. Let's just say that doctors can be interesting <laughs> to work with. <laughs> but our uh, dad was moping around the house and he was getting he was in his 80s and I started writing about the three years that we were stationed in England now, I was I had my 12th birthday in the ferry hotel in Cookham mm -hmm. on the Thames River I hope they were cooking ferries from the time I was 12 until just before I was 15 and I tell at the beginning of it don't look for, you know, erudite comments on politics because I was 12 years old. And if I go back to my memories, all I have are a 12-year-old's memories. But I think it's very important that we write these down because if we don't, history is going to be just a collection of facts, leaders, and dates. Mm -hmm. Where are the people? Mm -hmm. We have to keep the humanity in history. Right. And thank you, and thank you for, for saying that, because that sort of leads into um, some of my next questions. And I'm just so honored to be doing this again, by the way. Um, and so, like, um, during the first podcast, we talked about how writing, um, there's a healing process with it. And, and so, I guess that kind of is sort of what I'm hearing some of you guys talk about, but have any of you, you know, experienced some sort of healing or a better understanding of, you know, your situations through your writing? And, and through that, do you do journaling? And, and, you know, how does that work? You know, how, how does that work and relate with healing process, maybe for within yourselves, but also for your readers? I think that I would not, 
I was, I, what I determined after writing this book or while I was writing this book was just my, the presentation I made to everyone was that, uh, or at least allowed them to think about it, think it, was that I'd moved in with my father because um, he needed me. He was, you know, he was a widower. My, my, um, he was in his eighties. And so it was just a natural step for me to move in with him. And as I wrote that book, what I realized was he'd actually, and I knew this because he'd said, you've got to move in with me. I was the one that needed him. Mm-hmm. And I was, mm-hmm. um, I, it wasn't that I wasn't functioning. I was functioning, as I say in the book, to everyone else, I looked like a highly functioning you know, human being, but I wasn't. Um, I had gone through a very difficult divorce. Um, my mother had died with, and I and I was I'd been going through like three or four years of grieving and was pretty much stuck and on the way to I think probably as close to a breakdown as I, I'd be allowed to have <laughs> because there are rules. Um, but the book was so healing for me because I had I had my journals, you know, not all of them, but. Um, my journals from when I was a child or diaries, I had um, things I'd kept, I'd been able to keep every time we moved, I got a certain allocation that I could bring. Um, And then I was hearing these stories from my father that gave me a whole new perspective on um, what happened from his point of view, from my mother's point of view. And I learned that pretty much my narrative had um, needed a big edit. And so for me, it was, it's been a very healing experience and um, very necessary, I think. Yeah, I, I've, I've had the same experience. Uh, a good friend of mine who reads just about all my stuff, uh, she said, Jan, you have been writing so much about your father. Why don't you write about your mother? Well, the reason I didn't write much about mother was one, I was an only child Mother had had a dream when she was growing up. She had an invitation to Juilliard that she wasn't able to take due to the depression. And she wanted me to be that concert grade pianist. Well, if that was what she wanted, she shouldn't have married a husband who's tone deaf. (laughs) (laughs) But she did, and guess what? Me too. (laughs) So this wasn't going to work, which meant that she had me in uh, dance classes. I was taking ballet, which I had as much talent for as I do singing, which is off key and the key of nobody's ever heard it before and they hope not to. And uh, the Coyotes Union has been known to complain. And yeah, so I was not the kid my mother ordered. I was also supposed to be tiny and little and darling and just so pretty and just straight A's and missed again. And the result was that I had, uh, I was brought up by a super critical mother. Well, when I wrote it all up, I found it one, I've got, I've written about a dozen, the content of a dozen books in there for, if I use it as a source and not as a book, but, um, I got to look kind of at my mother's point of view and go, yeah, but mother, why? And of course, that'll never be answered. She's long gone. Because I write historical I have an answer for me. Go ahead. (laughs) Now, I have an answer for me that I I can use, and that has been very helpful. Okay. I was going to say I write historical fiction and biography, and research is critical to what I do. And even before COVID and now I do firsthand resources. I don't use the internet. I use artifacts. I I go to the Library of Congress or now I have to go online with the Library of Congress. But before I did a lot of travels, the geographical spots, I collect artifacts. For example, my mother lives about 20 miles away. And every time I go out to visit, I sneak stuff out of the sock drawer where my dad keeps most of his medals and things. So I got his dog tags. I got a lot of his um, insignia, a lot of his personal records and so forth. And so I'm pouring over those, cataloging them, taking photographs and so forth. 
And for example, I keep on my desk his dog tags and that stimulated my idea for a short story that I wrote for Johns Hopkins about how cathartic it was to find his dog tags. And so I believe in being able to touch history, um, talk to my mother, talk to, for example, for a devil's bargain, I'm talking to Vietnam vets, I'm listening to the iconic music and I'm cataloging um, photographs and stuff from that era. So that's important, the process that I go through for mm -hmm. historical fiction and biography. It's a matter of asking the, the right question. You can't just have a gem, the gem has to have a setting. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a very you good. You just have a cut gem, a pretty stone, a pretty story. The story has to have a setting. Exactly. It has to be a part of something. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's a very good process that you went through. Mm -hmm. uh, I use that process myself. We moved around the United States and uh, I, we lived in Germany. But when I did my, uh, started my memoir series, I went back to Virginia. We lived in Big Island, Virginia, up mm -hmm. the mountains from Lynchburg. And I went to the county seat there and found the records for the property that uh, my mom and dad had owned. Mm -hmm. And when we went to, uh, I went up to the cemetery to look at the various areas there at all of the relatives because they were buried by name in, the, in this church cemetery. And so I used that process of going back to each of the places. I went back to the place where I went to, elementary school. I went back to the place where I went to middle school in Georgia and back to the place where I went to high school in Oklahoma. Yep. So let's have Kate. Yeah, let's let's end with Kate here and go on to the next question. Okay. I'm glad, Sirky, I'm so glad you did that because I think this is, if, if I don't answer any other question in this panel, I think this is one I need to talk to. Um, most of my experience in the military was not that traumatic. I was a public affairs officer primarily in the Pentagon and in strategic command. So there, although knowing exactly what can happen in a nuclear world was pretty terrifying, but my experience in the military wasn't that dramatic. But I've been a, a volunteer firefighter and emergency medical responder for a number of years. Um, so there's trauma. And writing this book, even though I, I wrote it for others, thinking it was a subject that needed to be addressed, meant that I had to dig into my demons. And it's possibly the most healing experience I've ever had in my life mm -hmm. um, to have to do that. And, and I think a lot of people, they, we hold stuff mm -hmm. for our whole lives sometimes. Yep. And, and writing, whether you're journaling or if you're called to write a subject or whatever, I think large, largely the way to not only heal um, wounds, yeah. but also to access your own richness mm -hmm. um, Writing is a way to do that. And whether you're called mm -hmm. to write a story, whether you're called to write a memoir, whether you're called to write fiction, wh whether you're called just to journal for yourself, words are magic. And um, I would recommend if any, anybody out there has something that's unresolved, write, write. That's a way to get to it. Okay, so hold that thought. So that is gonna go right along with what I was gonna ask. Has oh. anyone ever come up to you after you have, you know, they've read your work and said they were moved positively or negatively or even had an aha moment about something you have written i i get that a lot oh sandy okay i'm sorry yeah i get that a lot because it gives a different perspective of an experience whether they were in america at the time of the vietnam conflict or whether they were brats and you know you mentioned trauma and i went through two coups People, 400 people died next to me, um, you know, in the writing process, it was a healing process simply because I could start to put the pieces together from childhood. But I found a lot of people that um, kind of find a place in the story in which they either have the aha, they didn't know that that's really what was going on, or as a brat that they, having lived overseas and having lived in areas where there were conflict in which you, you know, you follow your military family and, you know, you never know where you're going to end up or what's going to happen, that they could find similarities. So I, I have had a, a lot of experience with that. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. The Five Finger Paragraph is a book that, uh, a series of 17 different books written for 
teachers and parents to help their students learn how to write paragraphs and essays. Here. It all came about because I couldn't do it myself. So as a 24 year old college freshman for the second time, I figured out the light bulb came on one day during class. I figured it out, wrote it all down. Since then I have had, now if you are going to, if you're standing in front of a group of people, say you've got a, a group of a hundred parents sitting in a room, if one out of that 100 parents comes back to you in writing and says, oh, you did such a fabulous job for my son. He just, he passed and blah, blah, blah. If only one out of that hundred, that's the, that's the, uh, the norm. That's the norm. So 40 to 50 different times I've had students and parents write to me or call me and say, that's the greatest book they had in high school. Or that's the best book they had oh. as a fourth grader. What did I say? Very cool. Hey, so, so Leslie had something and then we got to move on. We are going to be here until the end of the world at this rate. I still have to <laughs> So we have to ricky cheeky this. So yeah, Leslie, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in since I'm kind of an intruder, but I just had to say um, in writing my book, I went with my daughter and lived for a year in Hiroshima and um, met and, and included the stories of survivors who my father had filmed uh, with his film crew. And I, I had not understood my father at all. I it was 10 years into trying to write this that I discovered a secret oral history he had left. And by the end of finally writing this, I had healed the relationship with my father, who's been, you know, had been dead for 30 years, but I felt like I finally understood him. And I have been amazed at the number of people that have come to me and said that this has motivated them to speak to their parents and their grandparents. And that just gives me such joy that you know, people are capturing these stories while people are alive. Um, so yeah, that was just what I wanted to say. Yeah, no, cool. And so Cersei, I think we might have to do a part three so we yeah. can get through all these questions. But <laughs> so looking at um, the news this day and, and the media, you know, when you're writing, do you find that you need to use certain words or, or if there's certain rhetorics that may bring on certain consequences? Um, like, so for example, like, are you deliberately careful with the words you use or how you write or choosing certain word topics? And, and I mean, if you do, I mean, as writers, you have a responsibility to do that. Well, if you're writing about an era, please use the grammar that would be used in that era. There's nothing like writing something that supposedly took place, say, out on the prairie in the early 1800s and having them use uh, 20th, 21st century grammar. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you know what you're seeing, it's hilarious because, uh, for instance, the, the saying, uh, off on a wild goose chase. Yes, there are really, you know, there are some comments about chasing geese that go back to medieval times, but that comment didn't come into general use until World War II and radar when during uh, the Battle of Britain in the fall, there would be geese going over and they'd show up as a radar blip <laughs> and they'd scramble the fighters to go get the, Ger the Germans and those Germans were Oh, geese. <laughs> sort of anti foul artillery. Yeah, right. The, the pilots, right. You've sent us off chasing wild geese. Sent us <laughs> on wild goose chase. Okay. So you okay. can have somebody in the 1700s or 1800s saying, You sent me on a wild goose chase because radar hasn't been invented yet. Right, right. <laughs> Are you talking about sensitivities to this, like cultural? Um, mm -hmm sorts of things. I mean, I, when I was one of the things I had my daughters read my book, <laughs> because um, I'm pretty careful having worked um, with newspapers and media. Um, but 
that's a very different writing for me than writing a memoir where I have to, t where I'm sharing conversations that other people said. And, um, but I did run my book by my kids and there were things that they would say, mom, you can't use that phrase. It might be insensitive or mom. And I would go, and I'm a pretty sensitive person. I just want to say that. These were pretty obscure. I wouldn't have known. And I had to, I talked to my editors and said, okay, you know, um, when I grew up as a military brat, we might use this term. It was 1959, you know, or 1960. They're not terms I might use, or I might be, you know, careful this day and age of using them because it, I should be. Um, but what do you think? And a lot of times we change things, but there were times they said it was, you know, you're having someone else say something that they would have said at that time. And it's a memoir, so it's true. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think if there are terms that you can use that won't make people uncomfortable, why not change your terms? Um, but, if it, but, if, but if you're diluting an experience um, that really happened, I think that um, it's a very hard thing to have to make that decision about that piece. I think it's just I, I, authenticity. Whether you're talking about a culture, whether you're talking about gender or whatever, yeah. try to get an authentic voice, especially for children. Mm -hmm. When I wrote the Willie Pearl series, I used mountain dialect. I had to hear it in my ear, which I was familiar with. The same with a strong right arm. There's a certain Southern dialect, um, the way that people speak, it's okay to use cracked verbs, misspellings to give people an idea of what the sound was. And I think it's okay, especially with children, to challenge people's vocabulary. Don't dumb the book down. Give them words that they're going to have to look up or give them the context to understand what the word means. You know, challenge them. Don't, I think too much time is spent now, especially with the homeschooling, you know, they're struggling, but give them something to reach up to. I mean, that's the brat way. Give them high expectations. Okay, last person. Robert, you had something to say or was Kate? One of you guys. I, Robert. I, uh, I've been criticized by members of my, uh, the British Historical Novel Society, where who, people I regularly communicate with, uh, for being too insensitive. And I point out that I'm writing for a certain period. It was a period of slavery. Uh, if you read things that you think are uncomfortable, it's because you would have been uncomfortable living in that time and you ought to feel that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the protagonist in two of my three novels is a, is a, a free person, uh, Emily West, who was indeed the Yellow Rose of Texas. And she gets into a lot of trouble in a lot of places uh, between uh, Philadelphia and, and Houston and the environs of uh, uh, the outback of Texas. And I think that's what happened to her. And the other thing that I do in the back of all my books, the three that I've done, I have written a fact versus fiction brief summary, which lets the reader learn something. And I have had that pointed out that that was a a benefit yeah, okay. that, that I have uh, told the reader what was fact and what was fiction that I wrote. Mm -hmm. And it's done in a very brief manner and it's done chronologically and you don't have to read it. Okay. Um, so I know Natalie has to leave because she um, has other engagements. See that the, a whole hour has passed and we have very few uh, questions answered. Um, Natalie, did you want to pick one of the questions you were going to ask and go for it before you sign off? Um, okay. Ooh, here's a good one. <laughs> I think it's good. So what do you think, if there's any, um, what is like maybe some of the, the biggest mistake or mistakes that you think you've ever made as a writer? And how do you recover from that? I can answer that one very quickly. I thought I thought I could write, and then I went to a, I went to a conference and met Charlotte Cook, who is a writing coach. And 
I don't even want to use the words she used on me. <laughs> uh, you know, a few thousand bucks later with Charlotte, uh, I am, I can actually call myself a writer. I don't care whether anybody reads it or not, but I am certainly a better writer than I was 12 years ago. That's, that was my biggest mistake, thinking I could write. <laughs> Trying to edit and write at the same time. You should just write it out and then go back and either edit it or let someone else do it. Just let it flow. Don't stop. Make all the punctuation and spelling. Don't be tempted to edit yourself. And don't procrastinate like I do. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> Honesty there. All right. Um, anyone else? Any last mistakes? Because I... Yeah. Yep. Um, the, the thing I learned when I had written my, my you know, as my blank blank first draft, um, if people read Anne Lamott, I was invited to a writer's residency. At the, I see some people know what's in the blank, um, to a writer's residency at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. And the first thing I learned is that I hadn't written a book at all, that I had lots of nice words piled up, but having been an expository writer as a lawyer and a judge, I just told it in, in you know, factual <laughs> order. And I was taught that one is supposed to tell a story with scenes and characters. And uh, so I had to learn to write um, kind of as Robert said, I thought I was already a really good writer. And then I found out I had to start from scratch to learn to actually write a story that would reach other people. You know, I was thinking as I was listening to you guys, and I'm going to just like throw a couple of questions together. So I know that um, Kate does a lot of consulting and publishing work, and we want to let her talk about how she determines what clients to work with. But I also wanted to say, um, uh, we were talking about hiring writing coaches and paying people to edit. So Robert mentioned thousands of dollars for a writing coach. So my question is, Kate, since you do a lot of this consulting and publishing work, what, how do you determine what clients to take on and what are you looking for? But then also, how much should you expect to pay for services? And where else do you get your help and inspiration to, to edit and uh, get feedback, etc.? Okay, so let's start with Kate, because I threw her name into the mix. <laughs> um, well, I guess I'll address first, because I do have a publishing sideline. Uh, and, and regularly get people come to me. And uh, it's books, if, book, if a book inspires me, uh, then it, to the point where I think it's something others should or, or would want to see, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a, a, a big criteria. I will say that periodically uh, I get phone calls from people and the question is, how do we get published? It's five o'clock. And I say, what have you written? And they say, well, we haven't written yet. And I say, well, what do you want to write? And they say, well, what will get published? At which, which, at which point I begin the exit conversation from the converse, from the, the, the dialogue. Because if you're writing because you want to get published, you're not really writing. Uh, you have to have a passion for the story. Um, and, and, and it's kind of catch come as catch can. Uh, our, our, my little publishing sideline, Dream, Dreamcatcher Books, I have another, a partner in that. And we began it years ago because we saw too many books that had the potential to create positive change that the mainstream publishers wouldn't look at. Uh, so that was kind of, kind of our, our premise for that. And, and for the books that come to us in that specific case, it's about whether or not that, that's an important subject and whether it can inspire and give people a vision to improve the world. Um, so I'd say that consulting wise, my, I'm, as a consultant, I'm primarily a grants expert. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, that's how I've made a living as a, a writer for many years is, is writing grants, mm -hmm. grant applications. Uh, and how I pick clients on that is if I don't believe in the mission, I'm not going to work for them. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, you know, I, 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 I would like to know if all of you agree, because writing is a calling. It mm -hmm. truly is. And I think those of us who have the ability to use words effectively also have a responsibility to make sure that effectiveness is applied towards something that, that we feel is important. 
I think, um, well, if you're traditionally published and get your manuscript accepted, of course, they have editors that are going to work with you. Mm-hmm. If you want to self-publish, and I've also been self-published, then it falls upon you to find a credible editor um, and someone that has the credential and the experience. <laughs> But I think a lot of the vanity press that's going on now, particularly with Amazon and people writing their own books, and there's just a flood of bad literature out on the website. Basically, anybody can pay Amazon a buck or two and get their work out there. That doesn't mean that it's good. And so readers have to be discerning. Um, seller, but booksellers have to be, cons- de- be dis- discerning because there's just a lot of trash out there right now. For me in particular, this whole Black Lives Matter movement, everybody is jumping on that bandwagon to put out books about, you know, people of color. Uh, and and it, 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 it kind of frustrates me because those of us who have been in it for 20 years, we know the difference between someone that's just telling a story with a black face and one that really, as you said, Kate, has social change, has authenticity that is going to help someone to step up to their dreams, that challenges them, gives them a sense of purpose, gives them a sense of their own history and identity. And I think we have responsibility, particularly as brats, we have, you know, we uphold those high standards. Um, And that's how we should, you know, represent ourselves. And I think particularly for, for children, but even broken people need that now. So, so also remember, as brats, we have a background that you cannot buy. We have been places, we have met varieties of people, we have lived in other countries long enough that we're just a little bit from that country as well as Americans. Mm-hmm. And I think that does give us a unique perspective. We should use it. So I'm going to split this question between Robert and Bernard. And, and it, it, Robert mentioned a writing coach. I want to know where he found a writing coach. We heard it cost thousands of dollars. And Bernard belongs to a children's writing group, something. So talk about that. And then we need to move on um, to the next question. But Robert, how did you find your coach? I went to a, a, a historical novel society conference in uh, not Gainesville, Florida. I can't remember the Florida town. Anyway, that was about uh, 2012 or 13. And uh, we went to a particular session on uh, basically how to write. And this lady, uh, Charlotte Cook, was laying out some, some rules of writing. She was talking about taglines and close third and those kind of things. I had no no idea what she was talking about. So I I asked her if she would be interested in reading what I was writing, and she said I would do that. And after the conference, I sent her the writing, and she uh, ripped me a new one, as they say. <laughs> and <laughs> hey, people and destroy you. I like that. <laughs> I uh, she. And then she, uh, I told her that he, she didn't need to be, you know, quite that blunt. And she said, well, then you don't want to hire me because wow. you have a lot of potential, but you have no idea how to write a book, or how to, how to set scenes. She said, this is awful. But she said, the idea is fantastic, but the book is awful. <laughs> so I hired her and I, I, she's, she's in Cleveland these days and we're friends now. I don't have to pay her anything, but I don't ask her to read anything <laughs> because over the <laughs> over the years, my son, my son, who is actually a very good writer, has his own website uh, and uh, is a, a music enthusiast, among other things, uh, edits my books better than anybody else could because he knows what I'm trying to say and and how poor I am sometimes at saying it. So he says, I don't think you wanted to do it this way, Dad. But we've got a good relationship. I don't know whether we'll ever write another book ourselves or not. There'll be books of poetry. I've been asked by a a black lady to 
edit her cookbook that she wants to put out. It's called uh, Big Mama Scratch Cookbook, and I'm really having a lot of fun with that because it takes me back to Tennessee days in the 50s. Because I think every recipe my mother ever cooked, she probably stole from some black woman in my hometown. And uh, we may have to write about that one of these days. But that's basically what I did, how, how I did it. So Bernard, what about the group you belong to? Uh, yes, I belong to the Atlanta uh, Writers Club. I was invited by the uh, a past president. Uh, I belong to the Society for Children's Book uh, Writers and Illustrators. And by belonging to that group, I've met people who can help me with uh, editing my books, with uh, doing my covers, my book covers, and uh, with the writing itself. T.K. Reed, who is an attorney in Conyers, Georgia, has a writing group that meets periodically, at least once a month. She uh, sponsors the group. She always provides lunch. So we go to her office and we, uh, we get together and uh, we write and review each other's work. And that's, what, that's some of the resources that I've used uh, in my writing. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I need to sign off. Natalie. Yeah, like, I, do, I do as well. Okay, well, then why don't we just wrap it up? Natalie, you go, and then let me just wrap it up, and we will do a part three. I guess we're going to have to. That's the popular demand. Darn, um, darn. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to it. <laughs> no, that's very good. Um, so the last thing I want to say, wrap up then, is what word of advice or lesson do you want to leave our readers with before we go? So just don't think fast. I mean, well, think fast. Just blurt out the first lesson or word of encouragement you want somebody to know. Hemingway said, write hard and clear about what hurts. Okay. Like I want to express a caution uh -huh. in a last word, because um, yes, you need to learn from editors, you need to, to learn from uh, your beta readers, you need to learn, but never give up your own voice. Right. Be very, very cautious about who you listen to, okay. um, because there are those out there, um, even professional editors, that they, they will try to turn your voice into their voice. So just right. keep your own voice. Okay. Who else? Who else has a lesson? Well, also, if you're writing something and it isn't quite coming out, go ahead and finish writing it because, one, you need to get it out. And, two, once it's down on paper, you can look at it, tear it up, and then write what you want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> write what will actually work. If you're, writing, if you're writing for fun, fine. If you're writing for profit, find another job. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> I'm retired. I can afford it. Okay. Well, something, that, something that helped me was to uh, think about structure. I had written a lot of things, so I got to have a lot of pasty notes. I could, you know, it just seemed to go all over the place. But I actually took a screenwriting book and looked at the structure of screenwriting and put everything within that that uh, structure, and it worked. Because before I couldn't quite get it to all work together. Okay. If you're going to be a, if you're going to be uh, a writer that wants to share their work with others, be a person who can tell a good story. If you <laughs> yeah. enjoy good stories and you can tell a good story, then you'll probably be able to put your words down on paper, and someone will actually want to read it. Mm -hmm. All right. so, I would say on your chat thing is write right or write wrong, but right. Right. Very good, Nancy. I was basically going to say what Johnny said, but in a different way. <laughs> but basically, don't stop. Just keep writing. That's what the editing process is for, to go back and look at what you've written and cut if you have to, add if you have to. Just don't stop. All right. Um, so I think we have come to a logical place where we want to... Um, to wrap it up, there has to be a part three. I mean, this has just been fantastic. Um, we wanted to thank you all for participating in this program today. I know you've given some great advice and some funny anecdotes and um, our viewers have a little bit more idea of what it's going to take to write a book. And also that 
you guys are all humans. Just because you've written a whole bunch of books doesn't put you on a huge pedestal. You're just human beings that have written down something. And um, so we will, if you will send me your author links, if I don't already have them, I will put them in the bottom of the podcast note page part of it. Um, and, you know, if you have a, a favorite agent or a coach or a group you belong to, like a writer's group, send me the link to them as well. I'm going to put that underneath so people might have some resources. Um, so I wanted to tell everybody, our viewers, who I hope have enjoyed this, that the program that you are watching right now has been brought to you by our sponsors. That includes the National Endowment for the Humanities, the New Mexico Humanities Council, New Mexico Arts, and several brat and service organizations. And I wanted to thank everybody for participating today. It was a lot of fun, a lot of coordination across five time zones. And we hope to do this again in the near future. So thank you a lot. Everybody, thank you, Sorcy. if you haven't signed up on Facebook to follow the museum, please do. All right, bye-bye. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you for letting me in. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.